these are my team colors. Uh, I'm from Arizona, so I it's go cars. But hey, we're doing it. I'm wearing this a couple weeks early. I know normally we do it on uh, the 11th. Uh, anybody knows that the, the the season actually begins on the 8th, but uh, I thought I'd, I'd I'd do it today because I really want to talk a little bit about a football football metaphor for you as we just talked today about. Uh, small groups. This is today is our small group fair. Uh, we have our small group leaders out there for you to have a chance to talk to them, meet with them, join a small group today. Uh, this, our, we believe small groups are a vital part of church life, and I want to talk to you a little bit about why. Well, most of you know that the Patriots have had a pretty good run the last few years with Bill Belichick and all of the Super Bowls he has uh, uh, accomplished. You may or may not know, depending on your age, about Don Shula, head coach of the Baltimore Colts and then the Miami Dolphins. From 1963 to 1995, he, had, he went to the play, through the uh, Dolphins alone. They went to the playoffs 20 times, and they went to the Super Bowl six times and had two wins. At the time, that was, that was record-breaking, but they still hold the record of having an undefeated season. Patriots came close, but the Giants stole it from them, as you know. Uh, so, uh, but it's still a, a, a huge, huge record, huge win. And Don Chula wrote a book called Everybody's a Coach. It was interesting in that book because he unpacks what made their team do so well. How they went from an average team to a contender for a playoff team to ultimately Super Bowl champs. And if you read this book, he kind of breaks it out into three main parts of what goes into a winning team. Three parts. So let's look at that. The first one is he talks about heroic off-field commitment. He's talking primarily about physical conditioning, but also playbook reading, film watching. But after regular practice, they're no longer, you know, okay, you're paid for this. This is your own time. On their own time, they would do wind sprints. They would run up hills. They would, the, the linemen would go back into the gym and do more weightlifting after they had done an entire day's practice. Just heroic levels, exceeding team expect, expectations at every level. Then they had effective team meetings. Effective team meetings where they had meetings and they would set goals they would review how they're doing. They would do performance reviews, and they would lay down team values. Hey, remember, we talked about 100% commitment. Another value of theirs was sacrifice, the will to win. And they would try to line everybody up to move with the same vision, you know, promoting a culture of unity and determination. And then also practicing in smaller units. So they'd get on the practice field. They would break into the smaller units. The defense would get together. The offense, the special teams, and the, they would go through uh, certain uh, uh, plays that you can't do alone. Some of the stuff, the wind sprints you could do alone. But this here, they needed to work as a team. How do we work together? Special teams working on punts and kicks. Everybody kind of working through their their, 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 their unique role, but within a small group. And that powerful triad made this incredible team. Now, Jesus says these words about the church. He says, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell, so there's a lot, a lot against when you're talking about the gates, and he's not using it metaphorically. He's saying the gates of hell. These are the actual forces, powers of hell coming against the church, coming against you, if you're a Christ follower, you're part of the church. But he says, will not prevail against it. So he, let, he says, there is this, he, it's almost like he's dreaming, because we see the church, we go, whoa, 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 it looks like we're not prevailing. So Jesus is casting this vision of a prevailing church. What is a prevailing church? Well, a prevailing church is a church that loves and is becoming more loving right? I mean, a, a, a prevailing church is one that is strong and is becoming stronger, is generous and becoming 
more generous, is focused, is unified, is empowered, is reaching people for Christ with the loving message of the gospel. Helping people to grow spiritually, grow in roots. They're serving one another, one another, humbly caring for one another. They're pooling resources to help the poor and to further the advancement of the kingdom of God. He's talking about the prevailing church is a victorious church, one that's energized and unified against all of the powers of the evil one might come against it, and yet God is bigger than that. That's the prevailing church. And so taking kind of this idea of Don Schuler's book, Everybody's a Coach, those things that made up his incredible team, I think those would apply to the church. What's a prevailing church? Well, I think it's just like we looked at individual commitment to off-site spiritual development. In other words, not just what happens on Sunday morning, but there's, there's a part where you play just making sure you're spiritually fit. You're in God's Word. That's why we just spent, you know, this bringing your, bring your own Bible, really not just studying the Bible, but how to study the Bible. We want to we equip you so that you know how to pray. You know how to read your Bible. You're, you're growing and you're spiritually fit yourself. It says take the time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit so that you're fervently praying. You, you, you understand the value of solitude and reflection. You have private worship. You, you're, you're, stu- you're having private acts of service, of generosity, studying the scriptures. You're, you're, you're allowing the, the prompting of the Spirit to lead you. These are all super important. Second is team meetings and group gatherings are highly valued. So this also contributes to the prevailing church's power, the redemptive potential to transform us and our community and the world. Corporate gatherings are important. These meetings where there's envisioning and teaching, worship, inspiration, correction, all of those things happen. It says they devoted. So this is kind of this, there's a lot of value to it. They're saying this is important. They devoted themselves to what? Gatherings. Gatherings were teaching and worship and prayer occurred. So their corporate gatherings are important where we come together. In fact, the Bible warns us, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up the meeting together, these corporate gatherings, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, when we stop getting together in corporate gatherings, we start to cool off. We lose vision. You see, for the Dolphins, those teams, the team members at that day, it was unthinkable to miss a meeting because they were, they had a dream they were pursuing together. And this was an important part of that, getting together and being envisioned together and, and, and having that key time together. And I would hope that for a prevailing church that we would see the value of that as well, that a lot happens where we, uh, we understand the strategic goal and we're all on the same mission. And when we start to not go, it affects other people too. If you have kids and they don't go, their little fledgling faith starts to cool off. And seekers, when they stop going, then they start to lose their way. Youth drift away. All kinds of things happen there. And then three is this faith is exercised in small groups. Just like the Dolphins teams would go and they would practice in their special teams. And well, we need to come together. There's some things we can't do alone. I don't know if you knew that, but in, the, in, in your experience with Christ, in your walking out, uh, a, a Christ-following experience, some stuff, we need smaller groups. We come together and some powerful things happen. Let us consider and give attention, continuous care to watching over each other, studying how we may stir and stimulate each other, helpful deeds and noble activities. When we come together, some powerful things happen. It says two are better than one because together they can work more effectively. If one of them falls down, the other one can help him up. 
that's hard to happen. That doesn't really happen in a bigger group because you don't even know if somebody fell. fell. And that's happened more times than I care to, 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 to want to talk about, where people say, hey, some tragedy happened in my life, and where were you? I'm saying, well, how would we know? Well, I come on Sunday mornings, but did you tell anyone? Are you in a small group? No. Oh, well, if you were in a small group, we would have known, we could have cared. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm just saying I'm not a magician. You know, I mean, I can't, I can't read people's thoughts. Uh, so Sharon's actually pretty good at that, you know. So I don't know if you've had any interaction with her, you know. Uh, is it, you know, spiritual discernment, or is she just super good at reading people? Well, probably both. But. So large team gatherings, super important. Solid, there is this part that we play individuals being spiritually fit, and then also a small practice squad. And that's why we take the time to talk about small groups and people open up their homes and people, uh, we have some here at the church. I mean, people study, get prepared. They're praying for you. We're, to us, we want a prevailing church. This is super important. Small groups can help you. Let's talk about that. First thing, they help you connect. Doing life together. Having authentic community where you not a bunch of pretend stuff. That, that interests me zero. In fact, it actually repels me. And probably you as well. I want a place where I can be myself. I don't have to pretend to be somebody that I am not. Uh, that is so, and you know, we have to do that a lot. Some, we have to do that at work. We have to do that in, 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 a, in a lot of environments where we're projecting one thing. Regardless of what's going on inside, nobody really cares. And so we, and we know that. In fact, people might take advantage of it. So we're just, we have this projection that's really not what we're going through and what our li- what's happening in our lives. But in authentic community, that is where we share honestly with people, even when we're going through challenging. The Bible talks about that. The, word, the Bible word for authenticity, being genuine, being sincere, telling the truth, opening up, sharing your pain, all weaknesses, all those things. The Bible word for that is confession. You're just open. Now, now, a lot of times in our mind, we think of confession, especially if you were raised in maybe in a religious environment. You know, you think of like maybe going into like a special room with the, somebody on the other side and the door slides open, you know, you're, you know, just pouring out your deepest, darkest secrets. Well, I, that's, that's an element of that, you know, I guess. But, but confession's much bigger than that. It's about just being authentic. He says, Therefore, confess your sins, the weaknesses, the things that you're struggling with to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. He says there's something that happens in a small group context where authentic community is happening. People have taken off their masks. They're just being real. Where healing starts to happen and we start to grow and we start to work through some of that. It says, dear brothers, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly right? I like that. When we're talk, when somebody's sharing and they're being authentic, what is our response supposed to be if you're the rec- on the receiving end of that? Gently, humbly, right? We don't have to give a bunch of advice. We're just like, because that's a, that's, a, that's a unique, special time. We're just listening. We're not going to lecture them. We're not going to try to lord it over them. No condemnation, no judgment, you don't have to be somebody who's just, you know, I'm going to just tell it like it is. You made your bed. you got to sleep in it all. Like, no, no, no. We are gentle. We are humble about it. Because, I, and listen, I've got, I've got, I, I have to just tell you, I'm going to just lay the cards on the table, okay? This is it. Because <laughs> you may, I don't know if you know this, if you're new to our church, but we have an alarming number of sinners in this church (laughs) and i'm first and foremost one of them so if you're looking for something different than that uh this isn't it right because the the, you you know you'd be shocked to know story after story of the struggles and the pain and the challenges and the fall after the fall after the fall and the mistakes And in this church, now, I I can't speak for other churches, but in this church, 
we don't do a bunch of judging. We are, we're gentle and we're humbly realizing that we're all in this together. You know, it's interesting. I came across this study uh, by, uh, oops, it's my notes down here. Uh, uh, so Dr. William Parker did a nine-month longitudinal study, three different control groups, and so they had, uh, and everybody was struggling with different issues. So what they did was they, they you know, I mean, they had people with different, you know, emotional, cry, you know, emotional issues, uh, different stresses in their life, and so they, 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 uh, they created three different control groups and primarily looking at what's better, authentic confessions as being real and prayer or professional psychotherapy, which obviously has value as well. So you had one was just individual counseling sessions by professionals over nine months. Okay, two, random prayer. So th they didn't teach you how to pray. They just said, you should just go pray about that. Okay, so... That'd be interesting to know, right? I mean, and then they, they, they tested this. And then lastly was weekly small group. You're in a small group, and the small group, though, wasn't just a small group. It was a small group where prayer happened and where authentic community happened, people sharing and talking about real-life stuff, okay? So after nine months, which one do you think did the best? Well, let's find out. Interestingly, 65% of the people did were doing much better who had professional counseling for nine months. So that's good news, right? If you're if thinking of getting professional counseling, there's a 65% chance you're going to do a little better. And uh, those are good odds for me. I like that. Uh, random prayer, no improvement. So if somebody's going through something, you go, you should pray about that. You might as well not say that, right? Or if you say, I'll pray for you, and you, it's just going to be a random prayer, so you're not... Might as well not say that. Lastly, interesting, 72%. No professional in the room. Normal, average, regular people, Joe and James, just sitting around sharing their lives and praying. Dramatic improvement. So that's one of the reasons. I mean, we're highly committed to... Uh, small groups, we, it's, it's very powerful. Number two, not just to connect, but also to protect. To protect. What we mean by that is, is who's got your back? Okay, you're in the connection, you've shared your story. People know what, you know, some of the stuff you're going through. But who's got your back? Because without prayer, without support, you're probably not going to see the prevailing church that you're part of really going forward. We want to be in a prevailing church. It says, therefore, confess your sins. We already looked at that. But also, pray for each other. See, we are in a spiritual battle. It's not just you and your struggles. It's not just you and your DNA and your genes. That certainly is a part of that. But there is a spiritual battle, a pushback against you and people you care about and your church, as Jesus referred to it as the gates of hell. And that's a war that's not going to end anytime soon. And so we got to stay vigilant. We got to stay, hey, I'm in this thing. And we cover each other through prayer and through just support. And count. You know, the Bible talks about one another, encourage one another. Uh, be there for one another, love one another. People learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. Something happens when we're together every day. Keep encouraging one another so that none of you is hardened by the glamour of sin. So there's this glamour this, this, that Satan is dangling in front of us saying, nobody will know. Nobody will know if you do this. Nobody will know. Of course, the minute we do it, Satan changes what he says. He says, somebody will find out. Somebody will find out. And just tries to hold that over us. You know, he's, or he's just, you know, it's, it, you deserve this. You deserve this. You know, that's the number one thing that people say. I've not done a lot of research personally about it, but so it's mine just from interviewing as I've been a regional pastor, overseeing about 30-something pastors for 10 years. And over that week, there was some, 
some failures. And also in our movement, I've been in the Vineyard Movement for over 30 years. And so there's been moral failures there. The one common denominator between all of the pastors that have had moral failings, they all said one thing, I deserve this. I des- I, how they deserve that, I don't know. But, you know, when we, we concoct all kinds of things in our mind. I don't deserve this, and so I deserve this, and that's why I'm going to do it even though the Bible doesn't say I should. I'll go ahead and just, you know, God will understand. And We have all kinds of How do we get through that? Well, when we are encouraging one another, when we're tempted to start to slide into a, in, into a different direction, and especially if you open your life up in that way, you say, hey, I'm going through a tough time. You're open about it. You say, don't let me off the hook. Ask me those tough questions. Our tendency is not to do that, mainly because we're concerned that people will judge us and, you know, those kinds. But if we create an environment where that, that's, that's, that's not part of our, our, our values, that's, we push that away and we call, you know, hey, wait a minute. That's not what we do around here. We're here to support one another. We're here to encourage one another, cheer each other on. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us, so we also to, should give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's our job. We're having a priority where this is most important. This is most important. I'm part of a prevailing church, the church that Jesus vision casted and dreamed of, we want to step into that, and I play a vital role. How? Connect, protect, and then also ultimately to grow, to take next steps, to take next steps. Some of, now, we have all kinds of small groups that are represented, and that would be my encouragement for you, if you're not sure which group yet, is, is you can go and look and, hey, you know, that looks like a great group, and that's cool, but my prayer for you is that you're thinking, which group is my next step? Which group will help me take my next step? And then I'll take the fun one that I really want to take later. But right now, I've got a next step. And maybe that's to take freedom and get involved. If you've not taken a, one of our freedom groups, we always say, that's your next step. Because that's part of God's sanctification process. We, we want to help you move, you know, that in your life so that you can, you know, the, all the dreams and the things God has for you can really open up. The Bible says, plans fail without good advice, but they succeed with the advice of many others. And so we need other people to help get guidance. God's kind of, he, he uses uh, people in our lives to speak to us, to help us. You know, there was a book written years ago called Pilgrim's Progress, and it was all about a, a guy who, who, who tried to walk out his faith all alone. That's not how it works. It, we do it together. Look at this verse. The more good advice you get, the more likely you are to win. I want to be on a winning team. I want, I want you to be on a winning team. Let's do this together. And so I encourage you to, you know, say... I'm going to get involved. I'm going to, some of you are an important crossroads right now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but it could be a, a crossroads in your marriage or in, in your relationship with somebody, in, with school, with your work, with your finances, with your kids. There's all kinds of things that we know we're at a crossroads. And, and, and down deep, you know, your next step, your next move on this could really set the projection of where this thing goes. And you're just not sure you want the best. Of, listen, if you want great advice, I have people coming up to me all the time. They'll tell me about something. They're at a crossroads or in a tough spot. They'll say, Andy, what should I do? Here's the thing. I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, sometimes God speaks to me and all, but you don't want me to just say, well, God says sell your house. Okay, next. I don't know. You know, I don't know what you're going through. That's too weird, you know? I mean, so... You, you want somebody who's in your life, knows what you're going through, so when they give advice, it has the context of all of the challenges, all of the nuances, all of the relationships. That's where you get good, godly advice. That's where you're going to get the advice where you're going to be able to win, not just 
you know, trying to get some kind of hocus pocus thing going on. And so there's something powerful that happens. People that are in your corner and they want to help you succeed. Last verse, get good advice and you will succeed. So in small groups, we want to help you connect. We want to help give you protection and you protect others through, through uh, you know, prayer, through accountability. We connect through confession, through being real, taking off our mask, having a place where we can be authentic, where people really know what's going on in our lives and can be praying for us. And then ultimately to grow, to take those next steps. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, we just want to take a moment here, if you would. I know I ended early on purpose so that we can have time to go and interact with the small group fair. But let's take a moment before we do that, before we leave, and just go before God. Would you say, God, I want to be part of a committed team for you. There's no greater adventure than that. To find a church that's all, all in for God and be part of that. Would you say, God, I don't want to just be a Lone Ranger Christian floating around And then if you feel God's maybe knocking and nudging you in this area of small groups, then pray this prayer. Just say, God, help me to find a small group. Help me to carve out the time to stop the excuses. Help me to find a place where I can, I can be myself. We can have fun. We can grow spiritually together celebrate the victories of life, and go through some of life's losses together. To be part of a group where I, I know we're going to spend eternity together, but we get to have a piece of that eternity here because our spiritual walk is a team sport where nobody stands alone. If you've never asked Christ into your life, I'm going to invite you to do that. Just follow me right where you're at. If you're online, you can follow me in the same prayer. Say, dear God, today, I give my life to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Would you do that? Say, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. Put your Holy Spirit in me. If you've already done this, you'd be praying for other people next to you. Say, put... Put your Holy Spirit in me. Forgive me for my sin. And help me to be part of the greater mission that you're doing in the world today through the local church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you're a small group leader and you're, you're doing one of the uh, standing at the table, would you get up now before everybody else? And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, and be standing at your table so when we release everybody, you'll be ready. So you can do that now. If you prayed with me, let me know about that. I would love to be able to reach out to you, pray for you. We have a great team of people that will pray for you. We want to partner with you in your spiritual journey. And you can do that on the Connect card. Also, if you have any prayer requests, let us know about that. On the Connect card, on the, the, the QR code that you can scan into your phone. Uh, that's a great way for you to give us feedback. We'd love to hear it. If you'd like to contribute financially to what we're doing here at Vineyard, that, that's an easy way to do that. Again, you can use the QR code. Uh, there's also, uh, you can text. You text to 45777, and then just in the text line, you just put in VCC and then the amount, and that would help contribute towards the vision and mission of this church. If you're new with us, we're just glad you're here. No pressure to give, okay? Well, we're gonna, I want to just close in prayer as we release. Would you stand with me? We're not going to have a final song. I want you to have as much time as possible to go and uh, would you just if, do me a favor, okay? If you're already in a small group and you're thinking you're just going to leave, just can you at least humor me and stay for a few minutes? <laughs> Make me feel better, okay? Uh, you know, I'd love that. So, okay, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And, Lord, we want to be part of that prevailing church that we are, are following you, your lead. Lord, help us, Lord, in individual commitment. Help us, Lord, in team meetings and help us in small groups. In Jesus' name, amen.